Okay. So, walk two days in a row. So, um, yeah, I may live to regret this, but I decided not to try to go into more of the stuff I rushed through at the end last time, but just to go on because there's so much to talk about today. Um, some of it will come back though when I talk about uh, Locke's view on how we leave the state of nature. So, um, but for today, um, the, the main things to talk about are property and paternal authority, and they're both very important. And this is section chapter five, and this is chapter six. Um, um, so property, uh, so first of all, Locke is famous for, um, defending or justifying the institution of property. Um, and by property now, uh, so as, I mean, as we'll see, this is, uh, as I've already mentioned before in the course, this is a narrow definition of property, like things that are mine. Um, so, and he does that obviously. Um, and uh, it's not like he's not, he is defending it against someone. Um, there, uh, there were various radical Protestant groups uh, and including, you know, people who are active in the English Civil War who um, were communists. And that is believed that all property should be held in common. Um, so, um, so he does have in mind that the institution as such might need to be defended. I think. However, I don't think that's the main issue that's on his mind, right? He's mostly arguing with other people who agree that there are property rights, but, uh, they disagree about where they come from. Um, and therefore they disagree about their limits and various other issues connected with them. Um, and actually we'll see that even uh, Rousseau, when, uh, so, I mean, Rousseau is not necessarily, I'll talk about as we get to Rousseau, it isn't necessarily always consistent, <laughs> but at least, at times when Rousseau seems to be attacking or sat, saying really bad things about property, he takes it for granted that he's attacking civilization when he does that. Right. So, um, so like I said, most of the people Locke is arguing with uh, agree that there is property and there should be property, but the question is like, what's the source of it? Now, um, as usual, to be more specific, Locke is explicitly arguing with Filmer, <laughs> right? So again, so like um, the um, the opposing view is that property exists because God gave everything to Adam. Um, so he's not arguing with communists and he's not arguing with Hobbes explicitly. He's like explicitly arguing with Filmer. Um, that's true, I already erased it, but it's also definitely true in chapter six about paternal authority. Um, this is one reason he keeps quoting the Bible so much. Right, because obviously Filmer bases his position on a 
you know, rather unusual, but still on an interpretation of the Bible. <laughs> um, so Locke spends a lot of time showing that um, reason and revelation agree with each other, and they're both against Milner. <laughs> um, uh, that's also why he quotes this guy Richard Hooker a lot. Uh, Richard Hooker was one of the founding theologians of the Church of Eden. I think I forget his dates, but he died in 1600. So, um, right, so he's like a respected Orthodox religious authority. Um, so Locke loves to quote him uh, in favor of his view and against Milner show that he's on the side of respectable religious opinion, not film, right? So anyway, um, 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 so uh, that's why it's because he's arguing with this view of filmers that Locke begins by arguing and like, so he's not conceding this. See, right? Well, let me say what this is, and then maybe it'll make it really clearer. That so he begins by arguing that natural things originally belong to everyone in common. Right? You might think if someone is like defending the institution of property, like especially if they're defending it against communist radical. Protestants, right, that, or some other kind of communists. So they would start off by saying, okay, I concede that originally everything was owned in common, but here's how we can get private property from that starting point. But since he's arguing with Filmer, it goes the other way. He's saying, like, you're totally wrong. In fact, everything was originally in common. <laughs> It's not that God gave everything to Adam. Gave, God gave everything to everyone in common. And then, like, the way this ends up being a defense of property is that Filmer is going to say, well, in that case, there couldn't be any property. Right? The only explanation for why there's property has to be that, that things weren't given to everyone in common. They were all given to one person. Who then, I guess, had the ability to to split them up among its heirs, right? Although Locke doesn't really allow him to say that, um, but I assume that's what Filmer actually means. Um, so, uh, um, so Locke says, no, um, God gave everything to everyone in common, but it doesn't have the absurd conclusion that there are no property rights. I'm gonna show why that's consistent with there being property. So that's like the structure of the argument, right? Um, so given all of that, like if you're if you like love private property rights, you don't it doesn't really give you a reason to, for Locke to be your hero. And if you like hate private property rights, it doesn't really give you a reason for Locke to be your villain. Right? I mean, he's not really, like, that's not the situation here. He's not inventing private property. <laughs> um, he's, you know, I mean, he is trying to explain where it comes from, but mostly in a context of trying to show where it doesn't come from. So explicitly, where it doesn't come from, he's trying to show is that it doesn't come from some grant of God to Adam. But implicitly, or you know, uh, but, you know, between the lines, as usual, I think he is trying to show something against Hobbes. And what he's trying to show against Hobbes is that property doesn't all come from the sovereign. Right, that we, so Hobbes' view is that we only have property rights because the sovereign gives them. In the state of nature, there was no property, but in the commonwealth, um, the sovereign has the power to assign things exclusively to subjects, and that's the origin of property. 
so, um, so like, and as usual, um, although he's really interesting, actually, <laughs> never mind. Um, so, uh, you know, so as usual, like the reputation of this view, which is kind of silly, is not actually that interesting. But the reputation or the argument against Hobbes is um, really serious, and a lot of things depend on it. Um, so, um, so what do they agree about, and what do they disagree about? And I guess I would say, right. So, as I said before, when I talk about Hobbes. Um, um, it wouldn't be right to call Hobbes a communist, right? He, he doesn't believe that in a in a commonwealth. So he doesn't believe that in the state of nature that everything is owned in common. On the contrary, in the state of nature, he, he believes that everyone claims everything individually for themselves, and just all the claims conflict, right? That's like almost the opposite of owning everything in common. And in a commonwealth, Hobbes. Um, thinks that the sovereign will, and presumably he thinks the sovereign should assign private property to people and like defend it and you know allow people some economic freedom and so forth. Um, but, uh, but he could be called a socialist because he thinks that all of that property is only, you know, due to the distribution by the sovereign and the sovereign can redistribute redistribute it whenever that seems in the best interest of the common. Um, so, um, so like an arguing event against that block actually is saying something like strengthening, giving a view of property rights that, that strengthens the common. So like, um, um, okay, and so this is this is how it works. So Hobbes and Locke, first of all, agree what is property. I'm going to erase Milner. All right. So so what is property? So as Hobbes and Locke agree, fundamentally, it's a limitation of other people's rights. Something, and but but now we have to think about it more abstractly to understand what how Locke's view is going to work out. Something which could be a thing like this book, but we could just as well be like something I I want to do, right? Like an action. Um, something becomes proper to me if other people don't have the right to interfere with. So like this book becomes my property, becomes proper to me if no one else but me has the right to, to take it. Um, so in other words, in the first instance, property is not a thing or a kind of thing. It's like a power, right? It's a, it's a power, it's a power of the kind Locke calls liberty. That is a power to do certain things without interference from others. Um, and so you can see right away why, given this definition of property, according to Hobbes, there can be no property in a state of nature, because according to Hobbes, there are no limitations on anyone's rights in the state of nature. But according to Locke, there can be property in the state of nature. Because according to Locke, there are limitations on people's rights in the state of nature. Um, right? And so um, um, according to Locke, uh, in a state of nature,
where is this limitation going to come from? It's going to be limitation by the law of nature. Right, so somehow the law of nature is going to make it the fact that um, as I drew it on my whiteboard at home last time, there's this sphere around me. And of course, I mean, when I draw this, I don't mean it's literally shaped like a sphere, right? Because it doesn't even contain things, it contains actions, maybe, or, right? But I just, but you know, um, in some abstract sense, there's this sphere around me where um, other people don't have the right to interfere. They're kept out of there by a kind of not literal chains, but something like Hobbes's artificial chains, right? They're kept out of here because um, being reasonable, they foresee bad consequences of interfering. And so they won't do. Um, um, so, um, so before explain, I mean, like, of course, it's not obvious how in a state of nature, like how in a state of nature, if you see this book next to me, how by mere reason can you can you come to the conclusion that you don't have a right to interfere with my music? Right? It's not like obvious how that's gonna happen. Um, so like most of Locke's discussion is about explaining how that can happen. Um, but um but like just taking for granted for a second that it can happen, this is gonna have big consequences for what happens when we form a commonwealth. Because um, according to Locke, we entered civil society in a state of nature already having property. Um, So as long as we observe the law, the state has no right to it at all. Um, well, no right to it at all. I mean, how is the state gonna work without taxation and so forth? So, well, no right to it all without representation. <laughs> right, so that's gonna be, and like how that part works is a little confusing and we're not, I mean, this chapter is about property in the state of nature, basically, right? So he's not getting to that issue yet. But, um, but, but so basically the idea is gonna be that, yeah, the state can't interfere with my property any more than anyone else can, except if like my duly elected representatives vote to tax me. And, you know, so and that's why the House of Commons has to, um, pass revenue bill, right? So it's like a justification from the law of reason for the civic division of powers in the British Constitution. All right, um, which also, as as you know, was like at least the official cause of the American Revolution, right? Taxation without representation. Um, so. Um, Okay, but so 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 like I said, the consequence of this change, you know, even if people, let's say, in a state of nature, don't have very much property, although we'll see that that's not necessarily the case according to law. But even if you know, it's even if this is kind of subtle, it still it makes a big difference in like conceptual uh, understanding of my relationship to the state or the commonwealth. Okay, so, um, so, so that's why this is super important now. Like how, is, how, how does this actually work? Um, so, 
so like so the key to it again is remembering that um, property doesn't necessarily have to involve anything. So Locke concedes and in fact tries to prove based both on reason and on by quoting the Bible that originally the whole world was in process. So if by the world, by the world there, he means all the things. So like all the acorns and whatever there was then, um, uh, not books, because right at the beginning of the state of nature, there weren't any things like books. There were only natural things. So um, um, all the acorns and everything else there was then belonged to everyone in common. So it sounds like there's no property, but actually it means there's no property in things to begin with. But I do start off, according to Locke, with a right or power that others have no right to impede. Because in the state of nature, according to Locke, no one has the right to interfere with my liberty as long as I remain within the law. So, so in the state of nature, uh, my in the uh, see again, state of nature sounds like a pretty simple idea, but it's actually right. It actually has different pieces that don't necessarily go together. Like sometimes, state of nature just means. I mean, I had occasion to emphasize this in Hobbes, and I'm going to emphasize it in Locke, and it's going to be even become even more blatant. And Rousseau. Wollstonecraft, for reasons we'll see, is not so interested in the state of nature. But, um, you know, on the one hand, it just refers to this like abstract state where people are not members of a common, common situation, right? So, like, whatever persons are not um, under a, the same. Uh, political society are in a state of nature with respect to each other. Um, so, like, um, you know, monarchs of different commonwealths are in a state of nature with respect to each other. Like, uh, according to Hobbes, the monarch and the commonwealth are in a state of nature with respect to each other. Or also, Locke gives the example of people, you know, people. Uh, stranded on a desert island, who I guess at least didn't to begin with be belong to the same commonwealth, or maybe they're beyond the reach of it now, or I don't know. Anyway, people like stranded on a desert island with no political society between them, they're in a state of nature, or like um, uh, Americans, as he usually calls them, meaning Native Americans, right? That's what American meant. <laughs> so, like Americans and Europeans in the inland of North America. They're in a state, state of nature with respect to each other. There's no political institution that includes both of them. But on the other hand, so like that can happen at any time, anywhere, right? But on the other hand, there's the idea of state of nature as like the original state that people were in at the beginning when there were no commonwealths and never had been. And uh, there were just individuals or perhaps families. Um, and uh, like, so most of those examples I was just given aren't examples of that state of nature. And yet already Hobbes and even more so Locke often when they discuss the state of nature take advantage of features of that original situation. Right, so like Locke keeps saying how there were very few people to begin with in the state of nature. The world was mostly empty, yeah. So uh, civil society, is that defined by like ownership? Yeah, civil society means it's, right, as I said at the beginning of the course, like polis and unitas and commonwealth and state, are basically synonyms, right? So like civil society means society in a common sense. 
civil law means the law of the time. Also, political society would be the same. Yeah. So, I mean, right. So, in that first sense of the state of nature, I was talking about state of nature is anything that's not civil society, it's not the civil state. But in the other sense of state of nature, state of nature is something that perhaps happened a long time ago. Um, so, um, um, and moreover, those two can interact in a weird way. And again, we'll see even more of this in Rousseau, but this is starting in Locke that, that like within the state of nature in the sense of that original state, there's a whole development that can occur before there's any commonwealth. So there's like the original state of nature, and then there's later stages of the state of nature. Again, if state of nature just means anything that's not civil society, then that doesn't make sense. But if state of nature refers to a historical period before there was civil society, then it does make sense. So, um, so what I was just saying is, or what I was just trying to say or I went on this long digression is that like, so again, according to Locke, to begin with in the state of nature, when, you know, let's say, and whether he believes this literally or not, I don't know. Um, probably could be pieced together from some other things he wrote that I haven't read, like the reasonableness of Christianity, uh, I'm not sure, but um, but you know, let's say this is how it started. Poof, Adam and Eve are created. <laughs> so there's only two people in the world, and they've never made anything or done anything. So what property is there? And Locke says there's already property. Each one has their own liberty as their property. The other one's not allowed to interfere with it. As long as they remain within the boundaries of the law of nature. Right, so remember the boundaries of the law of nature are like, I don't have authority to destroy myself or to destroy or waste other creatures um, or to interfere with other people's liberty or life or possessions. But there's no possessions yet. But so it's basically like, you know, if if uh, I'm Adam and you're Eve, like I'm not allowed to interfere with your liberty unless to prevent you from interfering with mine. It's the main thing that's going on here. So as long as you're doing your own thing, I have no right to interfere. Um, so that means we, again, we each have property because there's a limitation of other people's rights. Um, right, so Locke says this in chapter four, section 27. Oh, I didn't change the page numbers here because I have additional readings, but I should be able to find it. Yeah, page 19. Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. So the question then is how to get from this original um, natural property, so to speak, right? The property that everyone has just due to the law of nature to property in the narrow sense of possession. And the basic move to, to get past this um, spot is that there has to be something I can do. So since it's something I can do, um, and it has to be something that I have the liberty to do, right? That's like permitted by the law of nature. So the action is my property. Right? No one else has the right to interfere with this action. But somehow, by virtue of this action, something becomes property. That's what we're looking for. 
So we get this action, which is part of my natural property. And somehow using that, I make something now part of my property. And according to Locke, the act, this act is labor. Right, by labor, I make a new thing. It's not a natural thing. So it was never given by God, quote unquote, to anyone. Because I made it. <laughs> um, that is, it was never part of the original contract. Now, of course, I made it using stuff taken from the original contract. Right? So, like, and you know, in the simplest case, all I did to the stuff taken from the original commons was like move. <laughs> so, right, so what there was in the original commons was acorns scattered all over the ground and I gathered them up. And so the new thing I've made is the gathered up acorn. And um, so to speak, and this is how Locke talks about it, this new thing is like a mixture of one ingredient, which is the natural stuff that I took from the commons, and another ingredient, which is my labor, <laughs> right? I mixed my labor into the acorns by picking them up. And now there's acorns plus my labor. Now, I, I mean, so he does talk about it this way. And of course, so, and of course, this is important. The ingredients can't really be separated out again. Right, like once I've gathered up the acorns, of course, you can take them away from me and scatter them. <laughs> but that has the effect of like um, taking away the new thing from me that I make. You can't, but what you can't do is like take it apart into my labor and the acorns <laughs> and say, here's your labor, I'm taking the acorns, <laughs> right? That's impossible. They've been mixed in a way that they can no longer be separated. Um, so this, like, this is, uh, well, it's the exact same place I was just reading. Um, chapter five, section 27 on page 19. Um, Whatsoever then he removes out of the state that nature hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with and joined to it something that is his own and thereby makes it his property. So of course, this is a metaphor, right? I mean, it's not really true that when I gather up acorns, I mix some, some mysterious thing with the acorns that now can no longer be removed. <laughs> they're just the same acorns, they're just in a different place. Um, so, I mean, what does this metaphor mean exactly? So, like, I think it means something like this, that like the liberty of doing things without interference from others um, must include the right to benefit from the result of doing it. Otherwise it's meaningless. So in other words, this is part of what reason dictates we should all defend for one another, even in the state of nature, right? So just as now, let's suppose there's three of us in the state of nature, Adam, Eve, and Steve, or whatever. And, um, and, um, and like, I see, um, follow me you can see, <laughs> um, a sees B interfering with C's liberty. Like C is like, I want to walk there. And B is like, no, you don't, you know. So A sees that. Um, then reason tells A to defend C's liberty against B, right? That's the sense in which the law of nature res restrains B from doing that. At least this is the view in the treatise. Again, as I said, in the essay, it seems like God sees it. <laughs> and B should be able to figure out that God will punish them in the afterlife. 
Okay, but the treatise view is easier to draw, if nothing else. So, right? So, so like the fact that the law of, of reason restricts B from doing from interfering with C's liberty means reason teaches A to defend C against B. And so what I'm saying here about labor is now suppose what C does is go and gather up some acorns. And B says, nice acorns you got here, and takes them. So like C's liberty to pick up acorns, what I was saying is that it's it's meaningless if like B can come just just come take them. Right? Like that act can't like that act has no point if you can't somehow benefit from the result. And so reason teaches A also to defense these acorns against B. I think that's the literal meaning that's conveyed in the metaphor of like that C has like C doesn't just have acorns now, C has acorns with labor mixed in. <laughs> right? That's that is that C's act has become like somehow part of these gathered acorns. It means that like reason teaches A to regard the acorns as an extension of C's act. So to speak. Um, and of course, um, notice why this won't work for Hobbes. So, like, so, so this is the origin of all property and things according to a lot of right? It all comes about through the labor. Um, um, that is, that's, this is the only way that things can be removed from the common, the initial, the initial universal common is by labor. So like, for example, if I just see those acorns, well, actually, sometimes it's a little bit hard to know where to draw the line. What counts as an act here? But, uh, but at least from examples, Locke seems, it seems like Locke is clear that just like seeing the acorns is not labor, right? So like I walk into the forest and say, oh, look at those nice acorns. And then you come in and take them and say, hey, I saw them first. This is like my kids, you know, if we were to walk into a forest, one of them would be like, I call all the acorns. <laughs> so Locke is saying, you know, that doesn't work, right? Um, or like if you land on a continent, say, I declare this continent to be property of the king of Spain. <laughs> like Locke is saying, that, that doesn't work, right? So, um, but the only way to remove things from the common is to somehow work on them. Um, and and you can so you can see why this is a method of generating property in the state of nature, property in things, like property in a narrow sense, um, that won't work for Hobbes. And it won't work for Hobbes because according to Hobbes, we don't have that initial natural property. Right, like in the state of nature, I don't have the liberty to do what I want without anyone interfering. I have what Hobbes calls liberty, namely, there's no law against me doing whatever I want, right? But I don't have any of what Locke calls liberty. Anything that I do in the state of nature, according to Hobbes, everyone else has the right to interfere. So, so according to Hobbes, this process can never get started. Um, right, so like, so this is an example, like I said, of how, in a, you know, basically all the disagreements between them go back to that original disagreement, whether the law of nature places limitations on our rights in the state of nature. This, this is just about the specific way that we can get a limitation in the right to um, some things, the right to use them. Um, Now, uh, right away, there's an important limitation on this property, right? And it's basically the one that we've already seen. 
but he makes it a lot clearer what this limitation is. So when I say it's based on the one we've already seen, so remember, like at the beginning, he said, I don't have a right to destroy myself. So that's, you know, that's a limitation on my liberty. Like how exactly we're supposed to deduce that from reason, I'm not sure. Like whenever he explains it, he says something about us being God's property or something like that, which is a pretty, you know, like that's what Socrates says. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a pretty um, traditional answer, but the question is, what exactly does that mean according to law? Um, and how can we deduce by reason alone? And you know, so this is something I want to like um, emphasize. I think I implied this before, but the, every time Locke quotes the Bible in support of some uh, philosophical thesis, it's always, there's always a proof from reason alone. <laughs> and the Bible is like supporting evidence. Um, I think that's true. Um, it certainly had better be true when he's talking about the law of nature, right? The law of nature is supposed to be the law that's promulgated by reason. So it's got to be accessible to people who have never heard of the Bible. Um, right, so, um, so, so that's why I'm saying, I don't know, like, what is it, the question, like, how is it that we conclude and what does it, the conclusion mean? Or if we conclude by natural reason that we're God's property and we don't have a right to destroy ourselves. Um, um, I'm not sure, but probably the answer is going to be similar to the answer about the what the prohibition, what this wider prohibition is, where he says, nor even the right so, so much as to destroy any creature in my possession, except where you know it's called for for a nobler purpose than its mere preservation. Right. So um, um it's, uh, I mean, it's somehow connected with the same thing I was saying about labor, I think. That like your right to affect things is your right to like benefit from them, use them for your ends. That's your only right. So wastefully destroying them, it can't fall under that. Um, right, like if, you know, if what I do with the acorns is like, if I'm doing the acorns is sweeping them into the ocean, where they'll be no good to anyone. <laughs> and B wants to come along and interfere with that. Um, you know, by taking some acorns and make, you know, getting, making them safe, <laughs> right? So, so now I can't say, but my act would have no purpose if I weren't allowed to benefit from the result because I'm not benefiting from the result. I'm not benefiting, no one is benefiting. I'm wasting the acorns. Well, maybe I'm feeding the fish, I don't know. <laughs> Leave that out of it. So, um, um, so anyway, like in, in chapter five, he, I think is developing that same principle more in more detail when he says, um, so this is section 31 on page 20. It will, it will perhaps be objected to this, that if gathering the acorns or other fruits of the earth and so forth makes a right to them, then anyone may engross as much as he will. Now, why that's an objection exactly, I'm not sure. Like, why not say that in a state of nature, I have a right to, if I can spend all day piling up acorns, you know, fine, those are all mine. But anyway, he regards this as an objection and he says, to which I answer, not so. The same law of nature that does by this give us property does also bound that property too. 
And then again, he quotes the Bible, which is not helpful because it doesn't explain what his actual reason was. But he just says, God has given us all things richly. And he says, is the voice of reason confirmed by inspiration? But how far has he given it us? And he quotes the end of the verse, to enjoy. God has given us all things richly to enjoy, not to waste or destroy, is the point, right? That's how he's interpreting it. And then he goes on to say, as much as anyone can make use of to any advantage of life before it spoils, so much he may by his labor fix a property. Whatever is beyond this is more than his share and belongs to others. Nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy. Right? So, so the rule is, if I gather up acorns, as long as I'm gathering up acorns that I'm actually going to have a use for before they spoil, that's fine. But as soon as I go beyond that, I'm taking more than my share and other people can take it. Now, um, um, is this in the state of nature still? Yes, this is all still in the state of nature. This whole chapter is based, is still in the state of nature. Um, and it's, um, and, you know, again, that's what's, that's what's so different from Hobbes, yeah. right? That Hobbes can't have a discussion of property rights in the state of nature. There are no property rights in the state of nature. Right, so in the state of nature, I mean, it's actually a good question. So how far does this limit still apply in a common law? Um, but uh, I, now is probably not the right time to bring that up, but I might bring that up at some point. But in any case, in a state of nature, there's this limit. I can only gather as much stuff as I can use before it spoils. Um, Now, um, um, it might seem like it's far, fairly straightforward to apply this, but actually I think it's, it's complicated. So like, you know, um, suppose I'm gathering lots and lots of acorns um, and you come and say, hey, that's more acorns than you need. I'm gonna take the rest. Well, you know, not so fast because you don't know what I'm planning to do with them. For example, I might be planning to give them to someone else. Now, I mean, Locke doesn't really stop to explain why property, which gives which consists in this limitation on other people's rights also gives me the right to transfer that to someone else. Um, he kind of takes that for granted, I think. Um, and it's obviously pretty important. So I wish I knew exactly how he accounted for it. But anyway, he does take it for granted as I think we usually do that like one of the things I can do without anyone else's interference is give this as a present to someone else. You know, I mean, it's not exactly the same kind of thing that you do with something that's eating. It involves a transfer of rights. I can do it without moving the acorns at all. They, like I can say, I hereby give these acorns to so-and-so. Still be holding them. The rights are transferred. So it's, again, it's not really clear how we get that. But let's assume that we understand that. So I can give them to someone else. So uh, like, you don't have the right to take them until you see that they really spoiled. And of course, by that time, taking them will do you no good. So like, I think what this really amounts to is that I can be punished if that happens. And sometimes Locke puts it that way, right? So that, you know, the time I actually violate, or the time I clearly violate the law of nature is the time when the things actually spoil in my possession. I mean, 
I didn't make them spoil, right? Like it's not exactly like pushing the acorns off into the ocean. I didn't make them spoil. They would have spoiled anyway at the same time, I guess. But they spoiled in my possession, meaning the law kept everyone else out of them on the presumption that I had something to do with them. And then they spoiled. So at that point, I violated the law of nature and I can be punished for it. And how much should I be punished for it? Well, you know, what Locke says about punishment in general, enough to make me not want to do it again. It probably wouldn't be that much in this case. Like, what, like you know, how strong a desire do I have to have spoiled acorns? <laughs> you know, um, well, but still some, you know, like maybe I want to have extra just in case, or, you know, so are going to teach me a lesson? No, don't do that. All right. So, um, 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 and, you know, however exactly this restriction is to be explained, um, it's, uh, Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess this is actually a continuation of what I was just saying. So it's like, so the violation is for them to spoil in my possession. So like this restriction can only exist because the right of property can exist, right? That is, it's because the law is going to protect them long enough for them to spoil that I can violate the law and let them spoil in my possession. Um, um, if the law weren't protecting me, then uh, then I would be in Hobbes' state of nature. And in Hobbes' state of nature, taking acorns and letting them spoil is a use of them because it's keeping them away from other people. And the other people, if they get stronger, will attack them, <laughs> right? So it's like the, this, this, I don't know how to put it exactly, but this restriction, this, the right and the restriction, according to Locke, come together. It's because I have the right that there can be this restriction. Um, okay, so, I mean, so, so far we've got property in things but not very much um, because Locke says, you know, most of the things that you want in the state of nature uh, are like have a short shelf life, right? So, you know, you want acorns, plums is another example of chips. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, you know, the amount that, well, I think, I mean, his, his working assumption seems to be that like normally healthy people will be able without expending all their possible efforts to gather as much as they can possibly use before it spoils. And so pretty much that's how much everyone will have. So it's not that much and it's pretty much equal not completely equal. Some things last longer than others, you know, so like acorns don't spoil as fast as plums. So, you know, the person who gathered acorns can gather more than the plum person, but, but it's basically like no one has very much and it's pretty much equal. And one more thing before I go on and disturb this, this uh, idyllic picture, <laughs> which is that um, supposedly all of this applies in the same way to real property that is land. Um, in the state of nature, how do I get property? How do I get land as my property? And the answer is, and this is supposed to be the same thing as the acorn case by cultivating, right? Like plowing it and sowing and whatever. 
So in that way, I mix my labor into the land and it becomes my land. Um, and how much can I get? Well, as much land as I can use. So I have to actually be able to harvest it and use the harvest before it's spoiled, I guess. Um, or if I'm using it as pasture, I have to, you know, it's less clear. I mean, it's not really true that the grass will, will spoil if your animals don't eat it, the food product, I guess, but that's Locke talks about it as if that would be the outcome. You know, like if I tried to gather so much pasture, it's that the grass spoiled before my animals could eat. Um, so, um, I mean, it's not 100% clear that those cases are really parallel. Um, I mean, um, and in particular, it seems like in this case, rather than just punishing me, like what's going to happen is people actually will take away the excess land. Right? Because it's not the land that's spoiled. <laughs> it's like the produce I was getting out of it spoiled, or I never got around to plowing that land or whatever. And at that point, people are going to say, you have more land than you need. And they just like move in and start cultivating themselves, or they can. Although, as Locke keeps emphasizing, in this state, there was plenty of land everywhere, right? There were too few people. They, he said their main problem was not to, to lose each other in the wilderness. <laughs> um, OK, so anyway, that's the origin of property in like movable property and real property, according to Locke. And then obviously, the question is, about uh, you know what Rousseau calls the origin of inequality. How did it come to be that if, if this is the origin of property, how could it come to be that some of us have so much more property than others do now? Um, So in a commonwealth, the answer to that might be complicated because there are positive laws. There are civil laws that are made by the commonwealth that might somehow result in like unequal accumulations of property or something like that. But again, Locke is trying to answer that in the state of nature. He thinks in, in the state of nature, we can get inequality going. And the main answer to how we get inequality going is money. So according to Locke, you know, what is money? This is not a trivial question. <laughs> but according to Locke, what money is, is um, First of all, something that has its value by convention. It has its value because we all agree, perhaps explicitly, but likely in the state of nature, at least just implicitly, right? We just come to expect this from each other without ever reaching a formal agreement. Um, we all agree that we're gonna accept this thing in exchange for things we really want, like acorns and plums. Right, so like before the invention of money, if I had lots of acorns and you had plums and I wanted plums, I would say, hey, want some acorns. I give you the acorns, you know, I'll, I'll give you some acorns if you give me some plums and we exchange acorns and plums. Um, that's fine, that doesn't change, that, that doesn't make someone have more property than someone else or whatever. Um, at least simple transactions like that and imagine much more complicated things that maybe would. But in any case, um, but like that's a case where we're exchanging things that we both, you know, one of us at least actually wants. But money is something that we don't want or don't want very much for its own sake, but we've agreed to treat it as something, like we've agreed in common to treat it as if it's something we want and accept it in exchange for things, right? So now, like, um, I have acorns 
and you want some acorns and you don't have anything I want, but you have this money. So you say, hey, I'll give you some of this money for the acorns. And I know that I'll be able to use the money to buy plums from someone else. So I, so I, you know, because of this implicit agreement we have among each other. So I say, sure, here's some acorns, give me that money. And then I go buy plums. So, so, so that's number one. So it has its value only or mostly by convention. Um, number two, uh, I guess, you know, although he doesn't mention this at all, but I guess it's like relatively easy to store and carry around. Um, and number three, the most important thing, it's not perishable. Well, I guess number one and number three are both the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> the Spanish Inquisition. Anyway, um, so uh, um, right, it's so it's something we've we've agreed to accept in exchange, and it's not perishable. So, like gold or silver, even if it's not coin, can become money in a state of nature or something else that meets these criteria. I guess you also have to add that there isn't that much of it. Right. Otherwise, that maybe that's the same as the second requirement, right? Like if I say, well, let's make sand into money, but there's so much sand that, like, uh, you know, inflation is going to lead to me having to cart huge piles of sand. Mm -hmm. right? So we want something that there isn't very much. Of. Um, uh, so, but it could could be like seashells, especially if we live, you know, inland, in it, whatever. So, uh, but like Locke thinks it's mostly gold and silver, um, and so like the, in, by introducing this stuff, so I don't introduce any exception to the law of nature. I'm still only allowed to keep to to acquire and keep as much as I can use before it spoils but it never spoils. <laughs> so um, I can take any amount that I want. Um, that is, I can gather up as much as I want, either by just gathering it from the ground or whatever, or by getting it in exchange for things from other people. Um, now, what if I have so much that I can't use it as long as I live? Well, I can give it to someone else. And that someone else, I can give it to someone else right before I die. That is, those people are called my heirs. <laughs> right? So, uh, um, uh, so there really is no limit. Even the limit of my life, it's never going to spoil. I can get as much as I want and still have a use for it. Um, I guess that even before the invention of money, there's another thing that Locke kind of um, doesn't take into account. We'll see, Rousseau pays a little more attention to this. What about tools? you know, like stone axes or whatever. So they're not perishable. Um, so even before the invention, wouldn't it have been okay for me to make like a zillion stone axes and hoard them up and then use them to buy plums from everyone else when I wanted them? Um, and like, that might be a really significant oversight because you could call those the means of production, Marxist terminology, right? Like even in this original state of nature, there's a way for, um, even before the invention of money, there's a way for someone to accumulate without violating the law of nature as much um, property as they want. Um, and it can be property that everyone else really needs. It can be the means for everyone else to cut down trees and you know get the wood or whatever. Um, 
okay, but like I said, Locke doesn't go into that. So that's, I don't have more to say about that for now. I mean, there's also another thing that he doesn't talk about that I already like um, kind of touched on, which is giving gifts. So that's a permitted use. Um, well, like, as I understand it, like in nomadic empires, I don't know where I heard at least some course I took about Central Asian history when I was in college a million years ago. So I, maybe it's not true. But <laughs> what, what I've heard is that in nomadic empires, um, rather than like money and goods flowing up from the bottom to the ruler, the flow is the other way. So that the ruler like keeps, because, because like people, there's, there's no use to, having a lot of possessions, you can't move them around, right? So like the ruler of the nomadic <laughs> empire is the one who has the most power to give gifts to everyone under them. And it's because they're waiting, they're expecting those gifts that they want to like obey them. So this is similar to the, to the reason that Locke says that sons will want to obey their parents sometimes. Children want to obey their parents. So it's not something that Locke doesn't know about. But I guess he doesn't notice that maybe in the state of nature, again, even before the invention of money, that would give away for a, a use that someone would have for engrossing a huge amount of property. Because then they could get other people to depend on them for gifts. Okay, but again, he doesn't talk about that. So that's all I can do is point out that he doesn't. Um, but um, but the, the loophole he does point to is money. And of course, like, it's not immediately going to give rise to inequality, right? It's like, it, in principle, it just means that everyone can now get rich, right? Like, we can all go gather as much gold and silver as we want <laughs> and keep it. Um, but as Locke says, um, so this is chapter 5, section 48, and page 29. As different degrees of industry were apt to give men possessions in different proportions, so this invention of money gave them the opportunity to continue and enlarge them. Right, so even before the invention of money, people, you know, although everyone was equal in their right of nature, or everyone was not equal in every single respect. For example, some people are more industrious than others. Um, is that innate? Locke would presumably say no, although I'm not sure because it's not a principle. I don't know. But anyway, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter if it's innate or what. It doesn't matter why some people are more industrious than others. It, it, given that some people are more industrious than others, like uh, those people will be better at gathering acorns than everyone else. But um, in this original state of nature before the invention of money, uh, that didn't make a difference because, as I said, Locke seems to assume that normal, healthy people, at least, are, and the others, you know, are going to have to rely on someone else to take care of them, right? But, like, normal, healthy people are able to gather more than they need. So everyone is going to stop, you know, well short of what they could possibly do. And so the fact that some people are more industrious is not, doesn't give them any advantage. I mean, maybe they finish faster, <laughs> but they still end up with the same amount. So, uh, but now that there's an opportunity to gather more and to pass it on to your heirs, this, these differences, even if they're pretty small, um, are going to like cause a slight disturbance in that, in, in that equality. Right? Even if it's pretty small, it's, you know, still like one person gathers 5% more gold and silver than the other in the same amount of time. And, um, or, you know, what's now possible, right? Because it's, it's not just, so what happens is not just that we gave this money a new use that it didn't have, like invention, but we also gave everything else a new use, namely it can be sold. 
right? So like if I gather twice as much acorns as I need, I can sell that to people who don't have acorns and I'm allowed to keep the money. Um, right, right, whereas before, like if I gather twice as much acorns as I need, I can exchange half of the acorns for plums, but now I have more plums than I need. <laughs> right, so, you know, so, um, so this, this, this slight amount of difference in our industriousness will mean that, you know, one of us will end up with more money and other stuff than the other. And then that type of inequality tends to build on itself, right? Because like, if that happened today, then tomorrow I start out with a slight advantage over you. And my heirs start out with a big, with a big advantage over your heirs. Um, and even if that difference in industriousness is not in any way inherited, the, the excess money is Right, so this is a way that inequality can start and will naturally tend to grow. Um, I want to go on to paternal authority. That's this. This is this is pretty much all the important points about Locke's theory of property for our purposes right now. Uh, but um, I guess I do want to say one more thing about it. Well, maybe I should say two more things about it. One is about labor. So like sometimes you hear about what's called the labor theory of, val of value within this argument about who actually introduced the labor theory of value or whatever. But um, uh, the labor theory of value is, is, is the theory that things are only worth something because of the labor that was put into them. So Locke is not saying that um, because he says in many places something like 90% um, of the value of you know, a loaf of bread is the labor and only 10% comes from nature. So, right, so, he's, so he doesn't think the labor is the value, although he thinks labor is one of the most important sources of value. I don't know, and that's not that important for purposes of this course, because I'm not gonna, I don't think that's really gonna come up again, but it's uh, important, you know, to put this in context of other things. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that up to this original state of nature and the people who all had about the same amount of acorns and plums, Locke seems perfectly happy with the situation he's describing. But as soon as he, gets to this, he seems kind of ambivalent. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I think, I think he agrees with Hobbes that we should definitely like to be civilized. <laughs> and, um, and he thinks that, that like this is a necessary means to that. He doesn't quite come out and say that. He seems to think that, right? Like when he when he talks about how the how much of the value of a loaf of bread comes from the, um, you know, the people who brought the materials to make the tools from overseas in a ship, and the people who built the ship and whatever. Like I, I don't know how he imagines that kind of stuff being accumulated without this, right? Like just by people gathering acorns. Um, but uh, um, but so it's hard to say that he's that he thinks this is a mistake. But on the other hand, when he describes it, he, he you know says something often says things like um, you know before people started to desire more than they actually needed, uh, you know everything was equal. But then they right so it sounds like maybe it wasn't such a good idea. All right, again, that's all I can say about it because although he sounds a little bit ambivalent, he doesn't definitely doesn't come out and say anything negative about it. Unlike, as we'll see, Rousseau. So, um, okay, so are there any qu more questions about property before I go on to paternal authority? Not at all, okay. 
So, um, so the first thing Locke says about paternal, paternal authority or paternal power, wait, what's this here called paternal power? It's called paternal power. The first thing Locke says about paternal power is, um, that it should really be called parental power. Um, because this is chapter six, section 52. Um, whatever obligation nature and the right of generation lays on children, it must certainly bind them equal to both concurrent causes. Of it. Both concurrent causes of it means the father and the mother. So therefore Locke says we really should call this parental power because it belongs equally to the father and the mother. And um, then after he makes that point, he goes on to keep calling it paternal power. <laughs> I'm not sure why, right? He just, he, he says we really should call it parental power, but then he goes back to calling it paternal power. <laughs> um, I mean, not that he drops the point. He keeps pointing out that the mother has a share in it, whatever, but he doesn't take his own terminological suggestion. Um, okay, so remember that Hobbes completely agrees with this, right? Like that, that was Hobbes' argument for why um, um, uh, dominion by generation isn't really dominion by generation, because Hobbes says that, you know, generation proceeds from the father and the mother. Um, so, uh, um, so if there is some real dominion, Hobbes says, it has to come from somewhere else. But of course, um, uh, Filmer can't agree with this, <laughs> which is why Locke is, is beating on it so hard, right? That like, um, according to Filmer, the reason the only legitimate form of government is absolute monarchy is that God made Adam the absolute monarch of everyone and all legitimate political authority descends from that. Again, I guess I'm kind of without even reading it, I'm kind of getting an idea of maybe of what Filmer says that Locke doesn't quite give him credit for. Because Locke is like, well, then how can there be one more than one monarchy? But presumably Filmer thinks that Adam had the power to like split up his kingdom. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, um, but so, you know, but and if the proof of that is that, you know, originally God made Adam just by virtue of him being a father, the, the ruler, right? That's why Filmer's book is called Patriarcha, Father Rule, <laughs> right? So, Locke says, but if he had only called it parental power instead, he would have realized that this does, argument doesn't work at all, right? Because far from supporting absolute monarchy, it shows that this type of power was originally and is always split between two people. Um, However, as usual, like he does have an argument to make with, he does have an argument with Hobbes. So, I mean, as usual, both he and Hobbes are on the same side against Filmer. And as usual, Filmer's view is not very presentable, <laughs> right? So, um, 
but there are he does have disagreements with Hobbes. Um, and the disagreement is about um, I guess you could put it this way, is there um, a kind of paternal authority that's completely different from political authority? So Hobbes says no, right? I mean, Hobbes says that paternal authority, so-called, although Hobbes adds that in the state of nature, by default, it would go to the mother. <laughs> but Paternal authority, so called, is the authority, or paternal power, so called, is the power that someone gets um, by virtue of the fact that they have an infant and they can choose to nurture it or not. <laughs> and since the infant depends on them for its life, um, you know, uh, uh, they acquire absolute dominion. And Hobbes says, and that's just like the power that a sovereign has over their subjects, right? He says, the only thing that makes it different is if the family's not big enough to constitute a commonwealth on its own, then it, won't then it can't really be called political authority or political dominion, but that's the only difference. If the family does get big enough, then, it's, then the, that father is just like any other sovereign. The sovereign it's sovereignty by acquisition. Um, so why is it important for Locke to show? So, I mean, I guess it's important to say, so like Locke doesn't deny that in a state of nature, it might easily happen that fathers become monarchs of small commons. But he want, but what he wants to argue is that that's political power and there's something else that could more correctly be called paternal power or parental power. And that other thing has nothing to do with political power. So, I mean, I guess he wants to argue this partly because otherwise it seems like there's ammunition for Hobbes in the fact that we all kind of realize that there's authority of parents within a family. I think that's part of it. I think maybe also Locke thinks that this way of looking at what goes on in the family is disastrous and he wants to correct it, right? So quite apart from the implications for politics, he wants to explain what paternal or parental power actually is, where it comes from. So anyway, like this, the explanation is that there's three different sources of it. And I'm gonna list them not in the order too confusing. No, I'm still going to do it. All right. So I'm going to list them not in the order that Locke lists them in, but it, I'm going to discuss gratitude first, which he discusses second. Um, so, um, right, he says one source of something you could call parental power is a duty of gratitude that the children have to their parents for nurturing them and bringing them up. Um, um, so, I mean, the reason I wanted to actually discuss this first and kind of get it out of the way is because it's not very interesting because it's not really a kind of dominion at all, which is what Locke goes on to point out. Right, like gratitude, the duty of gratitude doesn't give someone else any jurisdiction over you. It doesn't give them a right to make rules that you have to follow, to set penalties. And right, it's, um, you know, it's something they have a right to expect from you, but they don't have a right to tell you what to do because of that. It's up to you to, to fulfill your duty. And like, and it seems like, according to Locke, this duty of gratitude to your parents is really like it's no different from any other duty of gratitude. It just happens to be big because of everything they've done for you, usually. Although Locke says sometimes there are variations in how much the parents have done for their children. 
some did more, some did less. So they did more for one child than they did for another. And then he says, and then this, this duty will vary. Um, so, you know, um, this really isn't the, any kind of beginning of political power. And as Locke points out, an absolute monarch, um, suppose there's an absolute monarch who's like king and um, the, his mother, the queen mother is still alive. So Locke says um, uh, that king has the same duty of gratitude to his mother as anyone has to them. But he's the absolute monarch. So those two things don't contradict each other at all because this isn't political power. Um, all right, so the second one is really the interesting one. I mean, it's interesting for a number of reasons, but first of all, it's interesting because Locke says, um, he says that, uh, you know, I'm not gonna read it from the book, but he says in paragraph, in section 55 of uh, chapter six, it is, quote, a sort of rule and jurisdiction, right? It does give the parents the right, to, and Locke would say not only the right, but more importantly, perhaps the duty to set rules for their children, to control what they do and tell them what to do and what not to do. Um, But Locke says, um, and that's why I guess I emphasized uh, more, more important than the right, it's the duty. This kind of rule and jurisdiction derives from the obligation that the parents have to take care of their children. Or as he says, this is chapter six, section 67, page 37. Um, he says this that um, the first of these, that is the duty, this kind of jurisdiction I'm talking about here, is rather the privilege of children and duty of parents than any prerogative of paternal power. Right? It's something the parents have a the, the children have a right to expect this from the parents. Um, and um, what is that duty derived from that the parents have and why does it give them a kind of rule and jurisdiction over the children? Well, in our species of rational beings, people aren't born actually rational, right? They aren't born with the use of reason. So someone has to take care of them. Um, well, I mean, they're, they're born actually with, uh, not only without the use of reason, but lot, without a lot of other things, right? Someone has to take care of them or the species won't be propagated. Someone has to take care of them until they're able to take care of themselves. But part of that is that they're born without the use of reason and someone has to take care of them in a very specific respect until they are achieve the use of reason. And the respect that someone has to take care of them in is that um, the legal protections we get from the law of nature derive from the fact that we're expected to follow the law of nature. Right, so as Locke says, you know, remember, Locke says, freedom is created by laws. So he describes someone who's under a certain system of laws as free of that law, <laughs> right? Meaning that law frees them from interference by everyone else. But it does that because of the bad consequences that everyone else anticipates on interfering with. 
And the bad consequences everyone else anticipates in interfering with this is because they everyone knows that everyone else, you know, wants the same rights as them. Um, and like, so they know that this person um, will be restrained from interfering with them as long as they restrain themselves from interfering with them, right? So like the reason that that this this invisible wall or artificial chain that keeps everyone else out of my sphere is dependent on the fact that they expect me in return to keep out of their sphere. That is, they know that I acknowledge the same law of nature that they do. But the children are born not being able to do that. Um, So, uh, right, Locke says what I just said in chapter six, section 63, uh, on page 35. Freedom then of man and liberty of acting according to his own will is grounded on his having reason, which is able to instruct them in that law he is to govern himself by and make him know how far he is left to the freedom of his own will. The freedom the law grants me is dependent on my being expected to know exactly how much it grants me and not overstep the limits. If we have someone in our midst who doesn't respect that, then the law doesn't protect them. Right? So, like, that's why Locke says the law doesn't protect noxious beasts. <laughs> right? Because we can't expect them to recognize any limits to their action. And so there's we can't, uh, they can't be free of our law. So the same thing would be true of children if it weren't that the parents step in and guarantee on their behalf that they're gonna observe the law of reason or the civil law in the common law, right? So that like the most important part of this from Locke's point of view is not, although of course that's important too, like keeping the kids from running into the street or whatever. The most important thing is guaranteeing that the kid is not gonna interfere in other people's life, liberty, and possession. And that's what gives this jurisdiction to the parent, right? It's the parent's duty to the child to ensure that the child lives within the law of nature. But Locke says, that's as far as it goes. But that's the purpose of it. So, um, so first of all, it ends as soon as the child does have the use of reason. Right, there's no continuing dominion. Number two, it obviously doesn't extend to things like making capital punishments. <laughs> yeah. If there were continuing dominion, would that make it political? Um, well, I guess it's the other way around. If it were going to be political, it would have to continue after the child grew up, right? It's like if we're going to the basis of a uh, oh, yeah. common law, it couldn't just end when the child grew up. Um, so, uh, um, you know, so on Hobbes' story or Filmer's story, you have to, it has to somehow continue. And Locke is saying that this paternal or parental power, strictly speaking, doesn't continue. Um, I see I'm out of time, so uh, I guess I'll just say, um, um, as I was just starting to say, it gives the right to set punishments um, within certain boundaries. But obviously, if it gets to the point of just of like killing the child or destroying, you know, taking away its property or stuff like that, but that's going to go against the whole purpose of the institution. So it doesn't give any powers like that, which Hobbes says um, that's the definition of political power. The magistrate has the power to, to impose capital punishment or anything less. Um, all right, and the last one is inheritance, which I won't write it, but I already talked about, right? So that's, you know, that's strictly speaking, not 
parental exactly, but it's a kind of dominion that the parent gets over the children because they expect to inherit, inherit from them. Maybe I'll talk about that next time because it's so important. I also didn't talk about dominion, about relationship between men and women. I didn't get to that. Like, does the father have some kind of dominion over the mother? So maybe I'll talk about that next time. Anyway, I'll see you then. Professor? Yes. Yes? Thank you, Professor. Oh, oh, sorry. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.